Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. I'm so excited to be talking to my guest this week. You want to talk about an OG of the fight game, an OG of MMA media and journalism, and someone that I can count on one hand the number of people in this industry that have legitimately helped me level up and take a massive step forward in terms of making a dream come true and working in this business full time. And it is my pleasure to introduce a friend, a previous colleague of mine, a peer, the legend, the goat himself, John Morgan. John, how you doing? I'm good, man. No, I appreciate that, dude. That's kind words. And not just about me, but the the kind words that you would just say about helping you. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't, you know, like actively think about that stuff. Um, but it's kind of cool to look back in retrospect and hear somebody say, bro, you really helped me take that step up. You really helped better me. That's cool, man. That's that's kind of what life's all about, isn't it? I, I, number one, I agree. Number two, I'm not the only one. And number three, I feel like long term, this is going to be one of the things that are going to is going to be tied to your legacy, because there are so many people in the business, in the industry that speak so highly of you. I'm one of those people. We'll get to a little bit of that in terms of our working relationship and the past a little bit later on. But you know what, John, I thought it'd be fun to start off with this. I know I've heard this story many, many times before, but let's go back. And I think there's a lot of people that perhaps haven't heard this story. Let's go to UFC 16. So John Morgan, <laughs> you're just a fan. And if you watch UFC 16 on Fight Pass and you've got a, a good eye, you might just catch a young John Morgan there, you know, sitting and standing cage side, enjoying the fights. Can you talk to me and the viewers and the listeners about your experience about attending your very first UFC event there? Yeah, it's pretty wild, isn't it, man? I mean, it was just coming up on the 25-year anniversary of that earlier this year, which struck me, man. I mean, obviously, I've been covering the sport and a part of the sport and around the sport for a long time. But when you really lay it out like that, 25 years, it's crazy. Uh, and yeah, if you ever want to pull it up on Fight Pass, it's funny. I had to go back and check it one day. It's literally like the opening scenes of it. So you don't even have to watch very long to see me in there. And it was uh, me, I guess, right around my 20th birthday, which is crazy. But uh, yeah, man, you know, I was kind of a, an early viewer of, of the UFC. I think the first UFC pay-per-view I ever bought live was UFC 7. Um, so it was really kind of watching from the early days. Obviously, uh, I, you know, the, the the VHS blockbuster tapes, that kind of era when you'd go in and rent them and that sort of thing. And it was coming to uh, Poncha Train Event Center, Kenner, Louisiana, which is outside New Orleans. And I was like, man, I, I got to go. I grew up in Dallas. And, you know, back then it's like, you know, a six hour drive or something like that. And I was like, I got to go. And and I tell you, I got to find it. I bet I still have the ticket stub at my mom's house. I've been thinking about that next time I'm in Dallas to go see if it's still there. Um, but if I remember right, man, I think I paid like 40 or 50 bucks to sit cage side. I mean, we had like front row seats, you know what I mean? For 50 bucks. Now you can't even get in the door for $50. So that'll show you the time and the era that's changed. And then, uh, you know, obviously I was there. I just got to watch it up close and, and loved it. And, uh, got to take the infamous picture with, uh, Vitor Belfort, which is crazy. I mean, 25 years later, still, uh, he's still out there fighting and doing his thing. Uh, man, it's just it's wild, man. It just, you know, the seed had already been planted with me at that point about how much I love the sport, but that just solidified it for me, my first live event. And, and I was like, man, I got to watch more of this and, uh, gotten to watch a little bit more of it along the way. <laughs> you certainly have. You certainly have. And uh, that's a great segue to my next question. How do you go from that first experience becoming a super fan to then thinking to yourself, all right, I'm going to now try and break into this industry and I'm going to try and figure out how I can, you know, make myself uh, break into the world of media, become a journalist. And, and what was that experience and journey like for you? Yeah, you know, it's kind of a wild one. But, you know, growing up, uh, I, I played soccer, baseball, basketball. I mean, I love being in a, a athletics, but you kind of realize early on, okay, it, you got to be the top 0.1% of anything to actually do this to play a sport professionally for a living. And, you know, I, I had fun, but I, I certainly realized that wasn't going to happen. But I, man, I love writing. I, I love telling stories. That goes to show you how old I am. Back then, you could be a sports writer. That doesn't even exist anymore. I don't think you got to do everything right. But I, but I loved writing, and so like in, in high school, I you know I got on the the, the news the newspaper and was the sports editor. I, I was the editor of the yearbook and started kind of taking a passion for journalism. And then you know followed that up into college, and then my life took kind of a a, a turn. And that you know I got done with college, and it was like I got, I got an offer to go into journalism for twenty five thousand dollars a year. I got an offer to go into restaurant management for like fifty thousand dollars a year. So I was like, well, math is pretty easy on that one. I'll take the the, the restaurant manager. I I had worked in restaurants to put myself through school. Um, so did that for a long time. I was, I was a general manager of a restaurant. I was making good money, all those things. But, um, I got to a point where I was like, man, I, I like what I'm doing for a living. I don't hate it. And I make good money at it. And I'm able to support myself, but like, this isn't what I wanted to do. 
Um, at that point, the passion for MMA had, had, had really kicked in, you know, huge viewer. I'd get my friends, you know, we'd watch it on the weekends. A lot of times what we do, this was really before the social media age, because I was in the restaurant business, we worked on Saturday nights. So we would, you know, record the pay-per-view or whatever and watch it the next Sunday. Or, we, you know, we try to watch it after we got off work or whatever. But um, anyway, you know, when I was going to school, I never thought of MMA as an industry itself. It was just something I loved. It was just the Wild West. It wasn't really an industry, but right around you know, 2006, um, which was a great time. The ultimate fighter was kicking off all that. I thought, you know what, let me, let me try this a little bit. You know, let me try to get back into writing a little bit. And if I'm going to get back into writing, if I'm going to get involved in sports, what's the sport that I love the most mixed martial arts. Let's check it out. And, uh, it was kind of wild, man. I was, a, I was a daily reader of, of MMA weekly.com. I was in the forums. There was a, a post that, uh, tag radio, which would soon become MMA junkie radio I was looking for somebody to help recap interviews and, I was just like, hey, let me let me do that. Let me let me do that for you. I mean, you don't know who I am, but uh, let me introduce you to myself. And uh, did that. And that's how I met Dan Stupp and because they were working with MMA Junkie. I'd never even heard of MMA Junkie at that point. Um, that's how I met Dan Stupp. And, you know, it started out as doing some free work. The free work turned into part-time work. The part-time work turned into full-time work. So it was a, it was a wild journey, man. What were some of those earliest memories? And this is, I would say, maybe pre-MMA Junkie. You know, what kind of gigs were you getting? What kind of content were you producing? And how were you kind of gauging whether you were, you know, taking the right steps forward in the business? Well, it's wild because the first way I got into it was MMA Junkie. It was recapping those interviews. Before then, you know, I was managing a restaurant. So I was just watching. I was just a consumer at that point. I wasn't creating content or doing anything along those lines. I was watching every pay-per-view. I was reading the websites every day. I was staying up on it. I mean, I remember getting uh full contact fighter newspapers sent back in the day, like pre-internet era. So I was reading about the sport that way, which if you can imagine that now we're clicking and refreshing all day, every day. This was something that was coming like once a month and you were reading about stuff that happened in Brazil or stuff that happened in Japan, you know, a couple weeks later. Um, but yeah, when I first got into it, I was basically just recapping the interviews that, uh, that uh, Gor Gorgeous George and Goals were doing on their, on their radio show with Frank Trigg at the time. I think, one of the I mean, I'm trying to remember what the first ones were. I I I knew it. It's been so long. I had remembered at one point, but it was just like listening to their interviews that they were doing and writing up stories and posting that on uh, on MMA Junkie. And that's you know that was kind of the connection. Obviously, MMA Junkie eventually purchased. You know, became partners with those guys and and all that journey that came. But yeah, the first content I ever produced was was MMA Junkie. So the first you know 15, 16 years, whatever it was, it was it, it was all them. But it was it was wild, man. When I first started out, it was literally just. Dan Stupp and Tom and Eric, the two guys behind the scenes that a lot of people don't know, they had just started the site and, and it started to grow right away. And, and I was the first person um, that they brought on part time to work with them. And it was so wild because I grew up in Dallas, Texas and through the restaurant industry, I got to a point where I would basically just travel around to underperforming units in our restaurant chain and like help kind of, you know, prop them up and get the systems right and everything. But at the time when I decided I was going to reach out and do that, uh, you know, I, I don't know how much you know about the geography of the United States, but I, I was in Dayton, Ohio, and, and Dan is a Cincinnati, Ohio guy. So I had moved from Texas to Oklahoma to Kentucky to Ohio and just, I guess, luck, fortune, whatever, as it happened when it when it came time for me and him to start talking we were a 45 minute drive down the road from each other where, you know, at one point we were, you know, halfway across the country. So it was just kind of wild how it all worked out. The MMA junkie story is incredible because what you guys and the team that kind of came over the years built into a powerhouse. I mean, you talk about, uh, for me as an outsider looking in, this is before I even contribute to MMA junkie myself, it was always MMA fighting and MMA junkie, MMA junkie, number one, number two endemic MMA media outlets. And, when you kind of were, you know, in the formative years, kind of building MMA Junkie and kind of going through the steps of blowing it up and growing social media and growing franchises and building out staff. Now looking back on it and seeing, you know, what it became, what are your fondest memories? And when you kind of look back on the years of, of building MMA Junkie to what it, what it has become today. So cool, man, to, to look back on it. You know, it's it's funny. Obviously, I left a little more than a year ago and it was a difficult decision to make to walk away, but it was actually... Uh, my mom, of all people, is I was kind of like, oh, like, man, I got man, kind of frustrated that I had to make this decision, but I did. And she was like, man, don't ever be, you know, upset. Like, be proud of what you built. And I'm like, that's such great advice. And I will. Like, I remain proud of what we built. And those early days are the great memories, man, of just like forming something. You know, before we were bought out by a big corporation and, and before we had corporate people telling us what to do, it was just me and Dan Stubb would be like, you know what would be cool? We should do this. 
yeah, let's do that. And, you know, there was no like, well, let's put together a proposal. Let's get it approved. Let's see if we can. It was just like, nah, you know what? That would be cool. And and I remember those early days, you know, I, you know, covering early events with him. And, and, you know, the first time he started to trust me to go do events on my own. I mean, Dan. Dan was uh, amazing. He's still a phenomenal editor. If anybody ever gets a chance to do some work with Dan stuff, as I know you can attest as well, man, he is a quality dude that will, you know, you talk about stepping up your game and, and helping improve. He'll help you do it. Um, but he's all, you know, I think he's changed a little bit. But he also used to be very much a micromanager as well. You know what I mean? So to get that approval of like, okay, you can go do this. I trust you. I don't have to be right beside you. That was big, but it was cool, man. Just expanding and, and, and being around at a time, you know, when the sport wasn't as accepted as it is now, like I don't think people maybe that are joining the sport now or or starting to follow the sport now, like understand it's not that long ago that like I would get on a plane to go travel somewhere and the person next to you goes like, oh, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a, I'm a writer about, you know, mixed martial arts. I'm a journalist. So I cover that. And I'm, ah, mixed martial arts. I'm like, uh, like the UFC, the, you know, the, uh, cage fighting. Yeah. yeah okay. Cage like, Will you cover that? That's crazy. Why do you do that? And you had to really explain to people like, no, this is this is a legitimate sport. This is not just some crazy thing. And and the athletes that are involved in it are, are, are really good individuals and they're really highly trained and highly dedicated athletes. And I think, you know, those early memories of just, you know, educating people about the sport uh, uh, of slowly building up the team that we built, you know, bringing on Steven Morocco, bringing on Matt Erickson, you know, bringing on all these, I mean, it was just building the team and, you know, building this, this, uh, this little army that we had at MMA junkie. It, it was fun, man. It was, it was a great time. And I'm, I'm proud to have been a part of it for a long time. When did you guys know that this is a big deal? Was it the, the USA Today sports kind of merger acquisition? Was it perhaps an event or just an insane bit of traffic that just came through? Was it being able to hire multiple members of staff around the world? When did you know that, okay, this is a real, real big deal? Yeah, it, so it got to a point. So how we were doing a great job building it ourselves, right? But it got to a point where we realized, look, there's two ways we can take this thing. Like either A, this is as big as we're going to get because you're kind of limited. I mean, it takes a lot more than just journalism skills and covering the sport, right? Like you've got to have somebody that understands the tech side of everything of running a website and they can handle all the stuff. I mean, we'd had these it issues and, and we had a couple partners that were really weren't full-time guys. They had other responsibilities to deal with it. So we'd have like an it issue. And it's like, well, who do we turn to? You know, we don't have anything as far as like, you know, revenue things. I mean, you've got to have advertising partners. You got to have somebody that can go out there and sell the advertising and you know, all those things. So we realized like, look, this is growing. It's getting big. The sport's getting big, right? It's getting more mainstream acceptance. Our traffic is growing month over month, year over year. But are we going to kind of blow this thing up to the next level or are we going to be kind of comfortable where we are? And that's when we started pursuing a partner and that and that ultimately ended up being Gannett. And I think that was a, a big eye opener to see that, you know, a major corporation like this was was taking an interest uh, in the sport of mixed martial arts and, and, and it mattered enough to them to not just be like, you know, they already had like a writer, but it was it's one thing to have, you know, a big major media company like that say, yeah, we'll we'll hire a guy to cover the sport. It's another thing to be like, no, we're going to go out and acquire this brand that has, you know, a staff of people that are going to cover this thing nonstop all day, every day. So it was kind of cool. I think we got to grow alongside it, but the, but the Gannett, you know, uh, purchase really was a big one. And then as far as the sport itself, you know, you just talk about the Fox deal and, and getting on network television. I mean, that it just, you know, we again, our, our growth kind of echoed the growth of the sport as well. We, we kind of saw it right alongside of it. And from a personal perspective, and then you mentioned this earlier on about how a member of the media today has to be essentially a Swiss army knife. So as you're kind of going through your own personal development and getting better at multiple bits and pieces in terms of what we're supposed to be doing here in the media now, when did you realize that, oh, wow, I can do this, I can do that, I can produce, I can edit on camera, write and do a bunch of different things? Because you don't get that from day one. That only comes with reps and experience and actually putting yourself out there and trying to do this stuff. A hundred percent. And it was difficult for me too, because, um, I mean, Sandu, I think you know me well enough. Like I always just kind of wanted to be behind the scenes. Like I've always been like, I just want to help tell the story of these athletes. I want to help document the history of the sport. Like I don't really need to be the guy that's out front and on camera and, and, and all that, but that's just where the, the media shifted. You know, it's funny. I, I will tell you one funny story as far as like, uh, different roles and the growth and that sort of thing. I think 
the <laughs> I don't know what made me just think of this, but like I think the Gannett purchase and the first time I actually had a story in print in the paper was the first time my parents thought I had a real job. You know what I mean? They're like, oh, there's a story in a newspaper that I can hold up and look at. Like, oh, son, you left the business that you were in. You're now in this business. This is actually a real job. You know, so that made me laugh. But yeah. It's just it's it's just where everything shifted. You know what I mean? I never thought I'd be sitting here in in my house with a microphone in front of me, like talking to people. That were I mean, it just never occurred to me. That was never a thing. But it is wild, man. And and it's the thing that I always tell, like you know, you know, young college students or people that are trying to get in the game. I always try to tell them, like, try everything, try every single role, get every single role you can, um, so that you can practice it. You know, is uh, man, I remember like Abby Subban, obviously a, a good friend of yours, partner of yours, you know, for a long time. You know, he was one that kind of uh, helped sit down with me and show me some video editing stuff because, you know, as we started getting the video, I was like, well, OK, I, I know, you know, now I know how to work a camera in the beginning. I never I never knew how to use a camera. I didn't know all that. I didn't do all that stuff. So I had to start using a camera. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't know what to do with it at that point. And I remember, you know, we'd be in like a, a foreign city or whatever. I'd have to, like, take my video footage upload it to a server a remote editor would download it and they would edit it and put graphics on it and they would post it and i was like this is taking hours like why is this taking so long like, i gotta figure out how to do this so you just start picking up these little skills along the way and, and doing it and, and now man it's just I, like i said i kind of joke about it but when i got into this i was like i want to be a sports writer like the hell is a sports writer bro that doesn't even <laughs> exist anymore dude like you got to do all this stuff now if you can't multimedia produce like what are you even doing anymore it's so true. I was uh, I was watching an old video. So prior to contributing to MMA Junkie, and you name dropped him already, both myself and Abby Saban. Abby, if you don't know him, he is like one of the best videographers, editors, social media producers, full time right now with MMA Junkie, and his fingerprints are all over the YouTube channel and and the social media feeds. He's just one of the best in the business. Back then, me and Abby were just kind of like making our way in the European circuit with our YouTube channel, and we always looked at the room. And you, one of the the individuals that I looked on, and I thought, okay, I've got to just figure out a way to do what he does. Let me see how he operates, right? And and then there was an event, I think it was in Stockholm in 2015. And I want to say it was Gustafsson versus Rumble Johnson fight week. And it was the very first time that we actually ended up uh, collaborating on a bit of content. And I remember it because uh, me and Abby thought it'd be fun to have a, a pink mic foam head for our microphone. <laughs> well, guys, first of all, let me say what an honor it is to unveil this beautiful pink <laughs> mic flag that I hear we're going to be hearing a lot of in 2015. That's our new uh, uh, investment for 2015 for our media kit. Yes. <laughs> Stepping up the game. Uh, and it was and it was a great because the backdrop was just a city covered in white snow. Um, and so my, my kind of question here is, is what were you thinking at that time of just the, not just both myself and Abby, but the European MMA media scene and what ultimately um, led you down the path of kind of noticing what me and Abby were doing and forming a relationship, a friendship, a partnership and getting us involved with them in the junkie at that time? Yeah, I mean, as far as speaking to you guys specifically, it was just a grind. And, and that's one thing that I, that I respect. Out of everybody that we ever brought on the team at MMA Junkie, and even still what I would, you know, shout out to people today is, is work ethic, man, that grind. You can't teach that. You know what I mean? There's so many skills out there that you can teach. Hey, you, you know, you could you could craft this a little bit better and it'd make you here. You could use this technology to make you a little bit better, but you can't teach work ethic and you can't teach somebody that actually cares about what they're doing. And you guys, I could see it right away. And that's one of the things I was like – we got to figure out a way that we can work with these guys because they care as much about this sport and they care as much about what they're doing as, as, as we do, as I do, you know what I mean? And that means a lot to me, man, like wanting to be as professional as possible and wanting to do it in the right way. But as far as the European market, man, and, and I tell this a lot too, to people that say, Hey, I want, I want to get in there. I want to do what you do. And I always tell them start locally, right? Like start in your market, whatever your market is, man, own that market you know what i mean because i i you know as much as i live this thing every single day i can't be as much of an expert into the people the athletes the teams the coaches the relationships the dynamics everything in your area as you will because you're around it you know all the time every time you know for me i, I get to do commentary with like cffc those athletes i know them man i get to speak to them all and so as they make their way up I can tell you more about them. But so for the European market, I mean, you could see the emerging skills that were coming. And it used to be, you know, in the early days, all the European fighters felt like they had to come to the United States to train. They had to get over and get the wrestling. And that was starting to change where you're like, no, there's there's all these teams out there. There's all these athletes over here that, that are doing it there. And so if people from that market are, are dedicated and they're caring about it, 
um, you know, they're going to be a big part of that. And then, of course, that just echoed uh, the, the growth of the USC globally as well. Right. I mean, it, it really started to become an, an international brand uh, and, and known around the world. And I think that's a big thing, too. You know, I, I hear people say, like, yeah, I don't know about the growth of MMA anymore. I feel like it's stagnated a little bit. And maybe it is a little bit in the United States. But like that's because it was on a rocket ship forever and you can't keep that rocket ship going forever. You know, eventually it's going to plateau to some degree, but you look at all these other markets out there where it's just started. It's in the infancy. You go around to these areas and you're like, Oh, that reminds me of the U S 20 years ago. That reminds me of the U S 10 years ago. It's out there. And and, and I think there's going to be more opportunities um, globally moving forward. And speaking of all these other markets, you are the ultimate road warrior. You've probably been to Brazil like 30, 40 times at this point. You've been to Europe. You've been to Asia, Australia. Can you just speak to that a little bit in terms of talking about the grind? You know, week to week, pay-per-view to pay-per-view. There was a stretch there, or I didn't even know how you did it, John. How you were in a different time zone, different country, and still churning out you know exceptional content. You know, being on the ground on the ground at all of these different events around the world. And I know it's a little bit different now because so many events are dem- domesticated. They're in the apex. They're in Las Vegas. It's a different world we're living in right now in 2023. But can you just speak to that run? And it, it must have been close to a decade where you were. I don't know how many air miles you clocked up, but it must have been quite a few. Yeah, man, I'm around like two million air miles, and and yeah, it was like every week, and and you know just all over the place. I remember there was one where it's like four four weeks, four continents, you know, for four different events, and and I loved it, man. I was proud of it. I mean, I really feel honored the fact that I, that I've gotten to see the world, man. I really, I do try to tell people, man, if you can travel, I, first of all, I just think for your own personal growth, um, just seeing everything in the world, man, I think it helps you kind of understand it. Like, bro, no matter where you're on the world, like we're all doing the same thing, man. We are, none of us really know what we're doing in our job. We think we're doing the right thing. We're just trying to make money and pay the bills. We're all trying to find a girl. We're all trying to find a, you know, have a beer or something after work. I mean, we're all do the same thing, no matter what culture, no matter where we are. So I think that's big, but yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing to me to really get a sense of the sport in different places. And, and again, just culturally and personally, but to see the sport over there as well. Um, it was amazing. And it wasn't the grind, man, but I wouldn't change it for the world. It, it you know, it, you know, Oscar Willis is a good friend of mine. He's kind of on that grind now where he's going to every thing and him and I have conversations that um because it's tough it's not easy like that unless you've done it it's a weird thing to wake up in the morning and be like where am I like hold on give me a second what what country man and like unless you've been through it, like you don't understand what it's like it's weird um and when I you know when I was single it was I, I loved it like I wouldn't trade it for the world for a young man a single man it's the best like go see the world go do everything get those experiences uh make those relationships do all those things it's amazing then you get married and you know, it's good, you know, but absence makes the heart grow fonder. You know, you, you leave a little bit and, you know, maybe you and your wife get tired of each other all day, every day. So maybe a couple of days away isn't the worst thing. She can go kick it with her friends. You can do your thing. And then you're excited to get back together. But when you have a kid, it, it does change things a little bit. And, and, and my kid's 11. So I'm still traveling, um, but trying to do it a little bit less, not really going to the international shows um, just because, you know, to fly to Australia, to fly to Singapore or whatever, like that doesn't become a five day trip anymore. You know, that's a seven, eight, nine day trip when you add in the travel. Um, so it, it changes a little bit, you know, as you get a little bit older and as your family dynamics change, um, I, it is a thing that I've started to realize like you, you will, you'll never get this time back, man. And as, as much as I love it and as much as there's no place I'd rather be on a Saturday night than sitting cage side and covering the sport and being a part of it, like, you know, I hate to say it, but one day when it all ends, you know what I mean? The sport's not going to be there for you. Your family's going to be there for you. And you can't ever get this time back. And you got to remember that. So now I'm trying to strike more of a balance, but I wouldn't trade that time in the world for anything. It was a grind, but I loved it, man. You know, the the people say, hey, you know, can you sleep on a plane? Like, dude, I can fall asleep before the thing takes off. And if I couldn't, I don't think I ever would have survived that whole stretch. But I, I still love it. Uh, just trying to do a little bit less of it. In, uh, in, and like I said, a blessed, blessed to have seen so much of the world. I think, I think, uh, like Moscow, Red Square was like one of the coolest places I ever went where I was just like, you know, as an American that grew up during the, that certain era of the Cold War or whatever, just that was one of those places where I like, I don't think I was supposed to be here. But even just so many places like walking around the amazing cities in Europe and um, and all that, you know, as, as, a, as a kid that, you know, a middle class kid from South Dallas, only child. I don't know, man. I just I never thought of myself as these big aspirations or whatever. But then when you get to go do these things. um, it's pretty neat. You know, it's pretty cool to be like, think about where you came from and, and, and to go out and experience all those things. Well, had you not been a road warrior, we wouldn't have met. You wouldn't have seen me, Abby, work. The domino effect of me being here I am right now talking to you may never have happened. So thank That's you it. for being such a road warrior that you were. <laughs> um, th- this might be a difficult question to answer. I don't know. But 
favorite city, favorite country, favorite fight week, favorite event. There's so many to pick and choose from. Gosh, yeah, man. There's so many great memories along the way. Like I said, that that Red Square in Moscow, man, that was a, a real cool, like, man, where am I right now? This is this is crazy. Brazil, man, going to Brazil, especially Rio, man. Rio is such a, a crazy city, you know what I mean? Like, just the vibe there is so cool. And, you know, the, you know, the crowds there are amazing. I mean, their passion for the sport, just the volume that's there. I mean, I'll never... The one that always stands out to me is, is uh, you know, Big Nog knocking out Brendan Schaub and looking around and just seeing people like crying. Like, I don't think people understand if you haven't been there. That dude is, uh, you know, a god down there. He's the national hero. Like, it's unbelievable. As many great martial artists as they had, he was so loved. So to see people actually crying in the stands over that, incredible. But, you know, George St. Pierre fighting in the Bell Center in Montreal. Like, the, that's one of the loudest venues you can ever go to. The way it's just built up vertically right on top of it. And he was he was a hero. Um, getting to see some events in Saitama Super Arena. You know, I never got to make it uh, during the Pride era, but obviously I watched all those shows. And so Saitama Super Arena, you know, it just, you, you think of it as this magical place. And so to finally get to go there a couple times and see some events, it's incredible. And of course, the way their crowd, uh, you know, enjoys it where they're, you know, you can so quiet, you can hear a pin drop, but then there's a guard pass and everybody claps a guard pass. And you're like, wow, the knowledge of the sport they have. So that's amazing. Um, something I wish maybe I would have done more of is there was a, there was a rare event where uh, we, it was in Zagreb, Croatia and me and, and cold coffee, Ken Hathaway were there. And it was a weird situation where to fly home on a Sunday was like $600 more expensive a ticket than to fly home on Monday. And the hotel rooms were only like a hundred bucks a night. So it saved the company a thousand dollars for us to stay an extra day. And we never did that. It was always like first flight out, go home. But we slept in a little bit and then just all the work was done. We were off and just wandered around Zagreb and, you know, enjoyed some, uh, some beautiful sunshine and some, some $1 frosty beverages with the exchange rate and a steak dinner. And so, sometimes I wish along the way I would have stayed an extra day here and there, because there's so many places I've been where people are like, Oh, did you, did you see this? Did you go there? And I'm like, no, but I can tell you where this really cool bar is, like right by the hotel, because that's where we went at night, you know? So there, there's been some great memories along the way, for sure. One thing I'll never forget is you always just say you always wanted to be at the very first UFC event at City X or Country X. And because the UFC have just basically almost been everywhere at this point, is there still one market, one country, one city where if the UFC goes, you're going to figure out a way to be there for that very first debut event? Yeah, there definitely is, and it's Africa. Uh, I I, I want to go to Africa. You know, it, it, there's a couple of cities left they're still knocking off. Like when they did the first one in Paris, you know, a lot of people are like, "Oh, are you gonna go to that one?" I'm like, eh, "It's a fight night, and I've been to Paris before, and I've, I've I've seen a lot of European shows. Like, I think I get what's going on." But Africa, man, I mean, just to to see that, you know, to see the first event there. I mean, number one, that's that's legit. That will be legitimate history. Um, and, and I definitely want to be a part of that. You know, we'll see what the card looks like. I mean, obviously, you know, we, when we thought about the three Kings for a while, that would have been amazing, but look, it's still going to be a, a phenomenal event and you can hear Dana's commitment to it, you know, a PI over there and he's going to get it done before he walks away. So, uh, Africa, man, that's, that's, that's the one I definitely want to see. And then from a personal perspective, after that, then I've committed to, uh, taking a helicopter or a boat or something somehow to antarctica because that would be the only continent i haven't been on yet you know what i mean so you got to check them all off and and i don't plan on being on antarctica for very long i'm talking about, i might just jump off take a shot of whiskey to warm up and head right back off but i mean what a, what a cool thing that would be personally to be like i have set foot on every continent on the planet that would be pretty cool um you mentioned earlier on that you were so proud of um, what your mom told you about your run at mma junkie and the legacy and everything you'd built and the the, the lives that you had impacted there. What ultimately led to you and MMA Junkie parting ways in early 2022? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's kind of a lengthy story and, and I, you know, I don't want to go too terribly far into it, but bottom line, what it boiled down to was I was really starting to have um, some passion for calling fights, man. I was getting to do a lot of work uh, with Cage Free Fighting Championship and, you know, working alongside CM Punk and, and, and you know, working with Rob Haydack and Brad Bolton and Jason Lederfon and the crew over there, man. It's just a great group of dudes. And I was really enjoying that side of it. And I had gotten to do some commentary early on. You know, I, I started working with Tough Enough right away when I moved to Vegas in 2008. Um, you know, where they did some Tachi Palace fight shows out in the day. It, it did uh, Titan fights, uh, Titan FC alongside Kamara Usman. Uh, you know, I mean, it had some amazing. And then there became a time at, at Gannett, you know, in the corporate influence where they're like, hey, you can't do that anymore. And I was like, all right, I guess. I mean, but and I didn't want to rock the boat. And I was like, okay. And, and so I said, like, all right, well, I'll stop doing it. And finally, we got to a point where, 
you know, Dan Stupp left the company and, and some of the other people that were executives at the company had had left uh, Gannett and USA Today. And so I kind of revisited it and I was like, hey, this is something I really like to do. And as much as I love my job, I've been doing the same job for 15 years. Like I'd like to do something a little bit more. And I got it cleared with them that, hey, I could go do that. And so I started doing some more commentary. And then there just became some conflicts of, you know, time management and, 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 and some certain things that were happening behind the scenes where, to be honest with you, I just got to a point where I felt like, unfortunately, um, I'd given 15 years in my company to help it grow and it wasn't given back to me to help grow personally. You know what I mean? And it was a, it was an unfortunate and painful realization because to be honest with you, Sandu, and, and you probably know this, I mean, we've had conversations. I didn't see myself doing anything else in life, man. I wanted to be that dude in the blue shirt, repping MMA junkie at like 75 years old, you know, the old dude that's like, Oh, you know, you saw Anderson Silva fight. What was that like? Like, you know I mean? I wanted to do that and nothing more. Um, but it got to a point where I was like, listen, I'm I'm having this passion that I really enjoy doing. And I was like, I, I think I'm decent at it. I think I'm OK. I, I think I'm going to go chase the aspect of, uh, aspect of my career moving forward. And unfortunately, that meant um, that I had to part ways to MMA, with MMA Junkie to do it. So um, not a situation I took lightly and, and and one that, again, like every now and then I'm like, damn, man, it sucks that that era had to end. But, you know, uh, shout out to my mom. As she said, you know, don't don't look back and be frustrated that it had to end. Just be be, be proud of what you did. Well, I knew about your passion for commentating and you've been on this incredible journey with CFFC. But alongside that, you went from MMA junkie to the underground, mixedmartialarts.com. And you're talking about an OG journalist with an OG outlet. That is a match made in heaven. How did that opportunity come about? And what is life like now? Well, almost coming up to a year and a half later with the outlet, where is the site at? Where are you guys at in terms of, you know, making it more established, growing the audience? And, and what's it also been like working alongside CM Punk and also working with the CFFC crew? Because honestly, it radiates through the screen. I could tell how happy you are. And also it feels like CFFC is becoming, in my opinion anyway, the number one regional promotion in the US to really nurture and grow the talent and get them in the UFC and Bellator and places like that. Yeah, it's cool, man. I mean, uh, CFSC, I could talk about forever. And, and I, man, I can't wait. Wait till you see what happens at the end of this year. We got some stuff cooking behind the scenes I can't talk about just yet. We've been teasing a little bit of it. Uh, but we got some big stuff happening. But, yeah, I love it, man. It's why, you know, working alongside CM Punk is a blast. That That's a funny one, man. You know, like, CM Punk, I, I remember when, when we first got paired up to work with each other, I'm like, how is this going to work? I'm like, I don't know anything about pro wrestling. A, a funny story about CM Punk when the UFC signed CM Punk. Um, I was literally, I had, I was like cage side. I had to like write the story. I was on his Wikipedia page, just trying to read stuff. Cause I was like, I don't even know what to put in this. Like, I know who the dude is, but I don't know. Has he been a WWE champion? I'm not sure. How does this work? So, uh, you know, it, becoming friends with him and working alongside him has been a blast. But yeah, as far as leaving him at junkie, working with mixed martial arts.com, UG Kirik old school was looking for somebody. And, uh, and, and yeah, you know, I, I was right about the time I was thinking about leaving. I'm like, Hey, I think we can do something here because it's an OG brand, but it's one that hasn't done a whole lot in terms of developing the website itself or the news coverage itself. It's been more about the forums, the UG forums, which still, I mean, it's crazy to see the dudes that have been posting there for 20 years, you know what I mean? And, and, and the old school traffic that's in there. And, um, you know, I was like, Hey, I, I think, you know, I, I can help you guys take this to another level. And it's interesting because, you know, there's some growing pains in terms of like, oh, yeah, I remember what it's like to not have a full corporation of like a whole team behind you because we have a, a, a deal with Sports Illustrated, and, but they're not an ownership group. So, you know, we have to work kind of alongside them. It's not that we can just go to their IT team and say, go do this, this, this and this. They're like, well, yeah, we got 50 other things we're doing, too, but we'll help. So, you know, it's been a slow process and I kind of forgot about what I was like, but it's been fun. And the cool thing is. They give me the freedom to go do everything else that I'm doing right now. And, and uh, man, I appreciate the kind words about it because it is, man, the passion. This is exactly what I wanted to do. And and um, and there's some even more stuff that, that's going to fly. It's it's crazy, man. Uh, you know, th that crew has been amazing at CFSC. The crew at, at MixedMartialArts.com has been fantastic. And th I think that's what's made it easier to to, to get over um, leaving the crew at, at MMA Junkie, which is tough, man. Walking away from the team was tough. You know, wa walking away from the team was hard, man, especially – um, with all the, with all the time that we had spent together and all that we had built and it was hard to walk away from that, but it, it is sometimes errors just end. Right. And, uh, and I appreciate you saying that you can see it. Cause I I'm so happy. There's, there's as much as I say, there's no place I'd rather be on a Saturday night than sitting cage side for a USC event. There is one more and it's, it's sitting cage side with a headset on and getting to talk about it and getting to tell those stories and, and, and really getting to be a part of it. Cause it's like, 
I'd be watching this stuff anyway. And now I can just sit here and talk about it and, and commentate it and tell these people stories. And um, it's fun, man. I, I absolutely love it. And talking about keeping a headset on and being passionate and also something that you own. And I think it was early 2015, you and Ken Hathaway, aka Cold Coffee, started the MMA Junkie. Well, it was the MMA Junkie Roadshow. It's now just the MMA Roadshow podcast with John Morgan. Um, I've been lucky enough to be on a bunch of episodes. And I think why I like this podcast the most is for the most part over the years, it's always the podcast that's on the ground. You're, you're hearing the stories on site, what's actually had, getting a feel of what's actually going down during fight week, event week from where, wherever the UFC is or Bellator is around the world. So many years later, I mean, talk about consistency. You have been churning out these episodes week on week on week. And it's a, it's a, it's a hard thing to do to remain consistent. But what's that journey been like both for yourself, the relationship with Kenny? And where do you see the podcast going in the future? Because it's already so established. You guys are killing it on Patreon. You have a hardcore audience and a following there. So congratulations on achieving what you have so far. But where do you see the podcast going down in the road in the future? It's funny because we just had this conversation this week. So, yeah, man, it's been eight years and we have not missed a single week. We have done one show every week. And that was the thing I always wanted to do was consistency, right? I wanted people to know, like, you were going to have one every week. And so we made it a point to never miss one. Um, but we are kind of talking about that. And one of the things that we did, you know, we had chances along the way for Gannett and USA Today be like, hey, do you want to be part of our podcast network? And, we, you know, that'll help us handle the ad sales for you and handle some of the tech side. And we were like, Nah, nah, we kind of want to have something for ourselves. You know what I mean? We want to have something that's ours. And we never really made a big push for it because we didn't want to be, we couldn't, well, we couldn't be in competition with our employers. So if we just kept it as some of a side project, you know, we could fly under the radar a little bit, but it's given us such an opportunity to get those reps. You know, the things that, that, that we preach, I mean, you touched about it earlier, but I always tell people as well, if you're on the way up, like, how do I get started? Just do it, man. Get reps. You know, I mean, how many hours have him and, my, him and I had just talking on a microphone, you know, sitting there and talking about the sport and and it just gets you that practice and it, and it helps, you know, kind of get you to understand where it is. So, you know, we're still in a unique position because uh, he still works for Gannett at USA Today and, and I don't. And uh, I think in the early days when I left, there might have been a couple uh, conversations along the way. We're like, hey, you still going to do that stupid podcast? And it was like, yeah, sure I am. How about that? Uh, so, but we're talking about where we can go. There's some limitations on what we can do because of the structures of employment, and that sort of thing. But, uh, but I think we would like to make some changes to it and, and, uh, you know, not traveling as much, obviously. And part of that is that the sport doesn't travel as much. There's so many shows at the apex, which I'll be honest with you, I don't terribly hate because it's 20 minutes from my house and I can go right down there. Um, but, uh, you know, still maybe, in, you know, incorporating some more interviews and some things that we're doing. So, um, we're actually in some discussions about that right now. Awesome. I'd love to get your perspective on both the current crop of MMA media in terms of the veterans that have had to change as the, the sport and sports media evolves and also the kind of the new generation coming through the ranks. Because like I said, you know, you've helped me, you've helped others kind of break into the industry. And I've, found, I've count myself so lucky and fortunate to still be involved when I look at my peers that perhaps aren't as involved or have maybe left the sport you know, entirely. So what are you, what are your thoughts on the general health of the MMA media in 2023? It's interesting because yeah, there are a lot of people that have been in the sport that have kind of moved on, you know, whether it was because their passion for the sport waned or whether it's because they just got other opportunities in other places, you know, and, and for a lot of people, you know, maybe MMA isn't their number one sport that they want to cover. You know, I always used to joke, you know, if Gannett was like, Hey, uh, we'll double your salary, but we need you to go cover baseball. Are you down for it? And I'd be like, and I don't mean to denigrate baseball. Like I played it growing up, but it's just like, no, like I, it's not, I'm not doing this about the money. Like I do it because I love it. So I appreciate you double my salary, but no, I want to cover what I love. As far as the new generation coming in, man, it's amazing to see. I mean, the, the technical savvy that everybody has. I mean, they've, they've grown up with it. They understand. Whereas my generation, it was like you had to say, you know, people were reluctant to pick up a camera. People were reluctant to pick up a microphone. People were reluctant to, to learn all these things. And now these people have been doing it from day one. And I, I think you're really starting to see now um, where in a lot of ways, man, your own personal voice and your own personal brand means more than being attached to any, you know, media outlet or, or a brand of that, you know? So, you know, used to, that was a, it's, it's funny you think about how the industry has changed. I mean, I remember, struggling to get a, a press credential from the USC for MMA junkie. Uh, and the only reason we could do it was because uh, Dan Stupp uh, also worked for the Dayton daily news. And I also worked for the Dallas morning news. And that's where we could get our press credentials from. And we'd actually have a PR member that was like, 
Hey, and I, I won't, I won't tell on her cause she's still a friend of mine today, but she was like, if I walk by press row and I see you with an MMA junkie tab open, I'm kicking you out immediately because that's not who you're here for. That's not who you're covering. Uh, so it's wild, but yeah, I mean, look, I, I think that, um, there's still some, some growth opportunities and especially, especially globally, man, especially globally. I think if you can really specialize to an area, speak to it. And, and I've told this to a lot of people along the way too, is like, look, if you're just going to try to do what MMA junkies doing, if you're just going to try to do what MMA fighting is doing, you're going to find it hard, man. Cause they've got big staffs and big budgets and it's going to be difficult for you. But if you can approach it from a little bit different angle, if you can do it in a little bit different way, if you can specialize in something a little bit different, um, you can make yourself valuable that way. So, uh, listen, I think the, you know, the sport is still growing. Uh, I, I think globally there's, there's going to be a lot of opportunity and growth moving forward. And, um, it's, it's cool to see that people, that, there's so many people that are just like, man, I want to do this. I love this. This is what I want to do. It's, it's really cool to see. Well, you just basically answered my next question. I was going to ask you to give some advice and maybe would that advice be different from 10 years ago? The advice that you would give a young up and coming journalist member of the media in 2023 versus in 2013. Yeah, I think probably the only thing I would change from 10 years ago is I would, you know, I, I struggled for a long time for people to, I always put the MMA junkie brand before my own, 100%. I always did it. And I'm glad I did it, man. I, that was the way, I mean, you know, that was the philosophy, put the brand first. I think that's changing a little bit, man. I think that's changing a little bit. You know, I, I think now uh, your, your individual voice, I think honestly, people connect to your individual voice more than they necessarily do a brand more so these days. I mean, certainly, you know, again, having um, the the backing and the structure behind you of a, of a major media company uh, can be very beneficial, you know, having that budget and, and the access and all those things. Um, but I think in a lot of ways, people connect to you to yourself. And so be wary of that, you know, certainly, you know, build your company and help be a part of that. If you can, if you get a, a big, a big spot, um, do it. But don't think you have to have that big company spot to do it, man. You can still be out there. You can do it. You can carve out your own niche. You can you can build your own voice even without having that major media backing. And I think you've even seen it, you know, with with uh, the mixed martial arts organization. I think you've seen it in, in sports across the board where it's like, I mean, you know, these, uh, you know, I, I hate the term influencers because I feel like there's almost like a negative connotation to that. But I think everybody across the board is more open to working with, hey, I'm just a guy that does this, but I have built a following and I do have an outlet and here's the quality of my content. Whereas it used to be again, like I said, laughing and, you know, I couldn't even get a credential for MMA junkie. They're like, no, we're not letting you in. You can get a credential now. You know, if, if you're going to start out and say, you know what? I want to get into this business. I think the first one, you know, I know the, I know the UFC is coming to Madison Square Garden soon. I'm going to go ahead and put in my credential application for that. I'm going to cover that pay-per-view at Madison Square Garden. It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. But, you know, a, a, a fight night out here on the road somewhere, something over there. I mean, even, you know, you can start out by just doing some of the smaller gigs. You start to build those relationships. And I think that's advice that I'd probably give too to people uh, is understanding you. Know, you talk about, you know, oh, the UFC or oh, Bellator or oh, the, whatever, you know, whatever company it is. The company is not something. The people that work on the front lines of that company are something. And those are the people that you're going to have to have relationships with. And they're ultimately going to say, yes, you can, you know, we can help you out with booking some interviews, getting you access, those sort of things, or no, we cannot. So um, I think it's important to remember that when you're dealing with those or organizations is that you're dealing with people. Yeah, I can't sign everything that you just said. As we wrap things up here, I'd love to just know from your perspective, the biggest story that you feel as though you've been involved with covered over the last 15, 20 years. And as we look forward over the next year or two, what do you think around the corner could be the next big story in the sport? I mean, listen, an easy one that, that really, I mean, COVID, I mean, you know, not to, not to talk about a, a political, because I know it's gotten politicized, but just that time of like Jacksonville and Abu Dhabi and Fight Island and being a part of that and witnessing everything firsthand and seeing how, I mean, that felt like history, to be honest with you, man, that, that was a wild time. And I'll never forget covering that and being a part of it and seeing what it all was. Um, but as far as, you know, just within the sport itself, I mean, I, I think just the mainstream growth of it. I mean, the acceptance of, of moving from, you know, Spike to network television with Fox to ESPN to signing global deals. And, and just, I just, I don't think people can understand how different it is. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that, that, that blue chip companies and, and w w didn't want to be associated with this sport at all. And now everybody's clamoring. I mean, uh, you know, 
I don't know if the UFC has any ad space left inside that octagon from all the people that want to be partners with, you know, they had to build like an LED deck around the octagon so they could get more sponsors from the people that want to be a part of, of the growth. So I think that's going to be a part of it. And listen, I, I think the globalization is going to be interesting moving forward. I'm really interested to see what the PFL does with all these uh, global, you know, uh, uh, leagues essentially that they're trying to do right. PFL Europe obviously is a big one. And now they're talking about PFL Africa and, and the middle East and Asia. And I think that's going to be real interesting is seeing the localization of it. Right. Because I think more and more, I mean, live sports is, is the one thing that people want to tune in for and see, right. Everything else, you know, you kind of watch it when you want to, you, you binge watch this, whatever, but that live sports is where it is. And, and you talk about these markets around the globe where it's like, you know, I, I don't even know when you were living over in Europe at four o'clock in the morning, watch if I don't know how you guys got through it, man. I don't, I don't know how you did that, how you became a fan, you know, but now they're going to put on, you know, uh, they're going to put on events in prime time around the world, you know, to these different markets. I think that's going to be big. And, and if they can pull that off, huge undertaking. And I've told them that face to face, like when they first said, we're going to be a champions league of MMA. I'm like, Whoo, that is a lot, but they're trying to do it. You know what I mean? And then, you know, I mean, belts were one championship, what they're doing, bringing things over. I mean, look, there's a lot of players in the game right now, and I think it's going to be important to see kind of where they all shake out over the next couple of years. But I, I do feel like there's still opportunity for growth with the sport. I love it. So, John, the way I like to end all my interviews, end all these kind of conversations on a, on a light, fun, positive note, it's a bit of a game. It's called the Bit for Social. And with you, we're going to play a game of likely or unlikely. All right? Okay. All right. Francis and Ngannou will fight in the UFC again. Unlikely. Unlikely. Ne Do we expand or we just leave it at that? We can leave it at that. Oh, no, I don't mind expanding. I just want, I don't know. I got to play the game right. I'm trying to keep us under a, under a minute for social. John, all right. Okay, all right so all if, right, we, ex if we expand, okay, it could be another Not podcast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nate Diaz will fight in the UFC again. Likely. That's going to happen. Conor McGregor will fight for a UFC championship one more time. Oh, they'll make up a title for that dude. Yeah, likely, man. You want, you want Conor McGregor to fight. They'll come up with the CMF belt or something, man. <laughs> we'll see some type of co-promotion between two of the following promotions. Bellator MMA, PFL MMA, and one championship. I think that's likely. I, th I think you'll find a way. I, I think they'll have to, and I think it'll be beneficial for all of them. Likely. Ronda Rousey will fight in the UFC one more time. Unlikely, unlikely. I just don't think she has a passion for it anymore. I, don't, I think her unceremonious exit kind of makes that something she just doesn't want to be a part of anymore. Brock Lesnar will fight at UFC 300. <laughs> I was joking about this this week. Don't let this man take Jim Miller's thunder. Do not let this man take Jim Miller's thunder. That's Jim Miller's spot. Uh, I'm going to say hopefully unlikely. And finally... The UFC will put on an open air stadium show somewhere in the world at some point in 2024. Ooh, 2024. Unlikely. Unlikely. I don't think Daniel, I think Dana's hesitation is enough that it's unlikely. I think it'll happen eventually, but not that's too soon. I love it. John, I appreciate you coming on my podcast for the very first time. Like I said, you're an OG, you're a friend, you've been incredibly impactful on my career at a very pivotal part of my career as well. The best of luck to you with MixedMartialArts.com, with CFFC, with the, the, the Roadshow podcast with Kenny. You've always got my love and support and, and hopefully I'll see you at some point down the road. Thank you, brother. Much continued success, man. I appreciate those kind words. Thanks for listening to this episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. It really means a lot to me. And hey, listen, if you enjoyed this episode, please go and give it a follow on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows.